songs, I've said this before, for your own church. There's something in the building of the relationship and maintaining a relationship, checking in on each other, really uh, finding and, and directing that back to really why. why. Why are you, why are we doing this? Ask yourself, you don't have to make it public, but ask yourself the private question, why are you doing this? You know, and there's lots of different answers, some answers that people don't want to talk openly. I mean, this is the job I get paid for kind of a thing. That's my answer. Or because, you know, my my father and my grandfather, or I'm a PK or I'm not a PK or I'm musically gifted. I just kind of fell into it or or this is my church. I want to serve. I mean, all of those are good things. But I would say now is a time to just dig deeper to your real. What is your real? Worship team, training members, leaders, pastors, audio friends alike, we thank you so much for coming back to the Worship Team Training Podcast, and this is our new season, second episode. We today are talking about Worship EKG, and I'll define a little bit more about what that is, uh, but you have your fabulous, I have my fabulous best people in the world co-host, Tony Guerrero and uh, Sharia Bissonette, who's sniffling. We are Swiftless today, by the way, so Swift is going to join us on the next podcast episode. But anyway, Tony, Sharia, how you guys doing? Doing well. Doing great. Good to All see right. you. Good to see you guys, too. You look fantastic. Thanks, Brandon, for having us. Hey, of course. Thank you. I don't normally get that, but I'll, I'll uh, like, in the words of Tony, I appreciate the lies. I worked pretty well. She hasn't been with you as you long guys, as we did. That's right. You guys aren't you guys aren't used to being spoken to well. I don't know what's going on there. I know. It's been it, it, we go we go it's way so back. Rare. We go way back and that's uh beneficial. So the uh, the worship EKG, and by the way, guys, if you like what you're hearing on the podcast, we ask that you would tweet and you can do that at worship TT, your comments, and also DM us on Twitter by the same handle and Instagram at Worship Team Training, as well as Facebook. So uh, let's get right to it. So in the midst of family loss, job loss, personal crises, local and global concerns, there's a lot of stuff flying around. I mean, we thought 2020 and 2021 was a nightmare, and it's like it just keeps continuing. Thank you, God, that COVID has calmed down. So we're all <laughs> thankful for that. But, you know, where we are today and where the church is, we are still dealing with a lot of ramifications. So how do we turn our hearts to God? And as scripture says, search, as David says this in, in the Psalms, search my heart, O God, and find any way in me, any wicked way in me. It's time to recalibrate, to check our anomalies in our hearts and the irregularities of the church. And so the only way to generate an honest assessment of what God is trying to speak to us is asking ourselves, how are we speaking to each other? How are we speaking to God? And how do we live life and the irregularity to maintain a heart after God? That is a mouthful question. So with that <laughs> said, no better person I'd like to ask first is Sharia, ladies first. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I love this title and I love the direction of it echocardiogram. I love it. I love it how yes. we're doing a check. People have to do that for their health. Uh, you brought up COVID and part of the long haul COVID uh, uh, problems that people have are irregular heartbeats. They went through so much stress. They went through so much um, impact from things changing that it's technically a part of what their body does. If we look at the the heartbeat of the church, and the heartbeats of our lives, we as well are affected not only by images that are out there, crazy images, people, TV, uh, violence. There's so much stuff going on, not just COVID related. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's all that. I think that affects us. And I think maybe more than ever is a time where, where as, a, as a people, as a human race, we are realizing the cause and effect of uh, current problems, current stresses. 
Um, you know, I, I love your direction and your stuff that you're doing, Brandon, with your uh, trauma survival and some of the things that you're also doing when you're talking about really digging deep and doing an assessment. I think that, that we're doing that on a personal level, but we're also doing that on a church level. And I would say probably my first uh, attention grabber would be what are we paying attention to? I think it's time that we return back to the things that bring peace, that bring truth to our lives. Uh, we can walk through just about anything if we have the truth of uh, not not progressive truth, not not changeable truth, but actual truth of having peace, that this is how we stay rooted in God. And then also as a church, being able to do that, um, talking to each other like we're talking to right now, uh, bringing the scriptures, bringing our uh, our perspectives of how God has uh, delivered us from from lots of issues. Um, he was overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, the word of our testimony, and what we've been through is our greatest tool in making these bridges, encouraging one another, refocusing on the things that are important. Mm. Nice, good word, Tony. Well, I want to start by saying I I always try to be careful when I'm speaking about things like spiritual health or how to, you know, get all this stuff right, because I don't ever feel like I've got it right. Um, so I don't, you know, sometimes when you're in a forum like this and you're being, you're presenting a subject, um, it's easy for somebody to assume, oh, this, I'm going to listen to this person because they, they must be getting interviewed because they know what they're talking about. I don't necessarily know what I'm talking about. You know, it's a, it's a daily uh, journey for me, um, with that. And so, um, you know, I just, I, I just want to say like, it's, uh, this topic is as useful for me as anybody who's in the worst throes of, you know, figuring all this stuff out. So, um, but the truth is, uh, or I believe anyway, is that at any given point, regardless, I mean, I, I've gone through all of this stuff I've gone through losing work, uh, being short on money, uh, divorce, uh, you know, health crises, people I love, like all of the, I've been through all of that also. Mm. Um, and I've also had some great, great highs in my life, uh, just great things that have happened and that I've been allowed to do. And I kind of have come to the conclusion that I'm sort of at any given time, I'm always both good and bad, doing good and doing bad, meaning even in the worst of situations and circumstances, my faith informs me that I'm in God's hands. I'm protected. I'm, yeah. I have a future, right. like how much better does it need to be than that? You know, but it doesn't eliminate the the problems. And as we're approaching Easter, you know, just, I, it's easy to think about Jesus in the garden or on the cross. Like he, he wasn't without suffering and pain, even though he knew this yep. great glorious end of the story, he wasn't without all of that. And um, you remember the movie, uh, I think it was called Inside Out. It was like an animated yeah. thing that came out five, six years ago. Mm. Uh, oh, it was so good. Yeah. But it yeah. was such a great um, a way to tell the story of how we learn to live with the good and bad in our lives at the right. same time, that they aren't, uh, they aren't mutually exclusive and there's good and bad at all times in your life. And so I, I do, so when things are really bad, or when they've gotten bad, I do try to make it a point to count the good things and focus mm -hmm. on good things because there are always, always good things. My next breath is a good thing, you know, and I, you can build from there. There's always good things. Um, but I also, as an adult, I can't remember a time where there wasn't some problem going on or something that was, right. you know, worthy of wor worry, I guess, or something, you know, it's always, uh, it's a constant. So both of those are constants for me. Um and I'll I'll close with this. I've I've kind of uh, come to this conclusion in my life over the years that we will constantly go through seasons. And I can look back, especially at my age now, there are many, many seasons where I had a whole different group of friends or social life or activities I was doing. And then little by little that changed. And then a different group of friends and then kids came and it was a different set of people or jobs or daily activities. And I, I'm at a place now where I'm starting on a new chapter, a new season. I don't know what that season holds, but it's different. My life in the next 
the next part of my life is going to look way different than the last 10 years of my life because of major changes that have happened. Mm -hmm. And it's just another season. And yet I can look at all those seasons at the, the good and the bad. So I know no matter what, there's still good in this coming season. It may not be my best season, but I know there's good to come. And I, I do try to focus on that. And uh, I love the, the, there's a couple of great standard songs like Sinatra's song, um, uh, when I was 17, or I can't remember the name of the song. Yeah. Is that what it was when I was 17? Mm -hmm. Just the way it, you know, right. the way it talks about seasons at this season, I was this, it's this season. I was this, yeah. it's just a cool thought. I only don't like the fact that I'm already in the last verse of that song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually past the last verse of that song. <laughs> I'm at the second ending. <laughs> no longer 17. Yeah. But we don't want to talk about that here. Um, so what, you know, with, with, um, I appreciate both what you said, because I really feel like that is a lot of what we're all going through in our own, uh, selves and our own worlds. So with the many seasons of changes and not moving to the next season, you know, there is, it doesn't absolutely, you're right. It doesn't eliminate what we're going through right now. So with that being said, what kind of worship leader worship leadership pastor included do you think that people expect lost you on the last part of that question what kind of worship leadership what what kind of worship leadership do people expect oh expect well um i mean like if you're a worship leader right now listening to this you, know, you worship leaders, especially young 20s and 30s uh, guys and gals, you know what? This is something that I really want for you to zero in on to listen to Tony, because the things that we think are important and we expect of ourselves is not so much the reality. So, yeah, I I mean, I don't know what people expect. I, I think these days we've developed a culture where people expect a show and they expect a certain level of production that I, I tend to find, um, I tend to be very cautious about because it can be very manipulative. Um, and so what, what we need in leadership is authenticity. I mm -hmm. think our, I think culturally that's a hard thing to get from in leadership because not because everybody who leads is bad or, you know, whatever, but there we have a tendency and this may just be a, a Western thing, American thing. I don't know. We have a tendency to want to present uh, something idealized. And I think that affects leaders a lot um, because you don't you don't necessarily want to expose where you're messing up and all that when you're on the platform. Um and and so I do. I think we run the risk of losing out on authenticity. I was uh, paying attention a bit to the uh, Asbury revival, right? Um, and yeah. what was going on there? I liked that. Uh, you know, I I can't speak to the authenticity of it. I wasn't there. I don't know. Um, I think even in the midst of, let's just assume the whole, or let's just pretend for a minute that the whole thing was just a big phony. I think even in those situations people had genuine experiences with God. Um, but I couldn't speak to the whole thing, but I do like that. They stripped away the lights and the fog machines. I like, I liked hearing about that and that it wasn't about the production. Um, and there's a, actually a really good article in, I, I'm going to, let me find this. I'm glad that you asked that question. I just cut this yesterday. <clears throat> it's a good, good article in the recent uh, edition of Time magazine about the Asbury revival. And I believe it was oh. written by a Christian. So it wasn't like wow. a critique on it. Mm -hmm. But there were three sentences that I I uh, highlighted. One was, uh, if a revival is simply the powerful, powerful surge of collective emotion. Um, oh, th this is a question, whether the a revival is simply the powerful surge of collective emotion or the product of stagecraft. Is it cool. really real? Um, let me see. The next one was uh, her church's routine revivalist strategies from the swells and worship music to lighting design, fancy lights and rock show aesthetics. I just found it interesting that mm. Time magazine is pinpointing these things. 
Um, given American evangelicism's oversaturation of synthetic spiritual spirituality, can we ever really be sure we're experiencing God? I mean, those are powerful questions coming from a non-Christian magazine about yep. something that I think most of us probably believe there was something real going on there. Um, and, and that's asking the questions like they stripped away all that stuff. So it's kind of asking the questions on the rest of us. And that's where uh, is that verse in Amos? I'm so bad at remembering things like this, but um, uh, where it says like away with your harps and your noise, like mm. I don't want to hear yeah. about yeah. that. You know, mm -hmm, uh, my, mm -hmm. God doesn't care about that part of it. He cares about the heart, you know, and um, and so ultimately what we need in leadership is authenticity. I think yeah. we are always we always run the risk and myself included of presenting inauthenticity. It's easier to do that than to be authentic. So sh <laughs> awesome. Sharia, let's tag on to yeah. that and, and ask you this real quick. So like if. The cosmetic of it leading worship right as tony was saying and i'm i'm paraphrasing it in one word cosmetic call it what you want is that really speaking are we speaking the same language to our the people we're leading uh I, i'm not sure i fully understand your question although i can tag on to what tony was saying i think tony's right on with being authentic I think that right now that word has such a broad, you know, uh, uh, definition sometimes. It's like, well, I'm authentically being myself and I'm a blah, blah, blah. I think I would add to Tony's word um, just just a uh, encouragement to know why you're actually doing it. You know, um, what is your reasoning behind it? But see, that's uh, my question. Yourself, or, that's my question. Yeah. Are we speaking the same language? I don't know. I, I don't know, because I think that there is a, a new education in my mind that, that maybe needs to be made. I think that, if, like uh, Tony, I just love what you said about things be, both being good and bad. I think P, uh, church right now is both authentic and presentational. I think everybody wants to be a good ambassador of who God is, but not everybody has traveled quite through their own Red Sea to make it to the other side on some of these topics where they're still trying to present obviously the very best. And I don't think everybody wants to hear the downtrodden or the ugly stories. I think that there's just, um, you know, to concentrate on a relationship that you have with your worship team, relationship that you have with your congregation, the congregation you've been given. We we're just talking about this, about really stewarding who you have. You know, what if you have a very, you know, um, a, a, a very street, um, humble church that you're supposed to um, steward? Then you be authentic with that in serving the people and serving the purpose and speaking the language of those people, of your people that God has brought you to. If you have any other kind of church, whatever that is, that, that's even writing your own songs. I've said this before for your own church. There's something in the building of the relationship and maintaining a relationship checking in on each other, really uh, finding and, and directing that back to really why, why, why are you, why are we doing this? Ask yourself, you don't have to make it public, but ask yourself the private question, why are you doing this? You know, and there's lots of different answers. Some answers that people don't want to talk openly. I mean, this is the job I get paid for kind of a thing. That's my answer. Or because, you know, my, my father and my grandfather, or I'm a PK or I'm not a PK or I'm musically gifted. I just kind of fell into it or, or this is my church. I want to serve. I mean, all of those are good things, but I would say now is a time to just dig deeper to your real. What is your real? Because before you can be authentic with the outside, you sort of have to know what your reason is. Hmm. That's good. I, I, I think that when people, when leaders are faced with that question, what am I doing this for? It's so easy for them to, like you said, not talk about the real reasons, but they mm -hmm. slip into this well it's because I'm supposed to, and I need to forget about myself. Basically, I need to forget about the problems and just do the job or get caught up in the leading of worship, which there's a, there's a good part of that of getting caught up in it, but not when you're detaching yourself from reality, uh, mm -hmm. because then it does come across that cosmetic feel. And that's mm -hmm. why I asked the question, are you really speaking the same language? In other words, mm -hmm. like my family and I, we went through a very drastic uh, episode, which we had to cancel the recording of this podcast. But 
was it two weeks ago or something? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and um, our oldest son landed in the mercy room. Um, he contracted um, a really bad virus and it, mm -hmm. it was just for 12 hours, we were on pins and needles and it, it was a very serious uh, mm -hmm. infection. And we really just did not know what was happening, but the whole entire time, our son just kept saying, mom and dad, God is with me. And he's 12. He's with God is with me. I know I'm going to make it through, but God is with me. And the next day, I mean, he brought him, we brought him home that evening. And the next day he was jumping up and down, dad, God healed me. Um, cool. And that, that was just a joy to my spirit, our, our, our whole family. And then I thought to myself, you know, how do we, how do you live with that? Because what if it wasn't a happy ending? You know, mm -hmm. what if it just continued and I was to lead worship that next morning? You know, do I, like you said, Sharia, do, do you just, you know, be downtrodden? Uh, mm -hmm. or, or maybe, maybe there is a, a space for that. Or do you just fake it so that others don't know? But I find that there's a lot of relativity, of course, in our day in, day out, because when you read the life of David, he was very much like that. There was no mm -hmm. skirting the truth. Uh, there is the actual gripping into the reality of digging deep and embracing the tragedy of saying, God, this is where I am. However, I know you're not done yet. So that was our attitude was, you know, this is great now, but I know God is not done. Tony, like what you said at the beginning of the show, um, there are better things to come. Tony, I think you were going to speak first on this. Let's restart that because I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, um, I can about, speak on it first. About, going through, it. about going through my own experience, <laughs> instead of covering it up, I'm, I'm dealing with it authentically. Oh, I remember. In approach to leading worship. Got it. Go, Tony, so, go. And go, Tony. Um, I, I think of two, uh, two people, a worship leader and a pastor, who were both at previous churches of mine. Um, the worship leader guy was somebody who would get up there every Sunday and like, you know, let's let's face it. The guy, he was just one of those guys that things never seem to be going right for. But he would give that to the congregation every single week. Like you are downtrodden, you are beaten and, you know, the devil's got you down. And sometimes I would think to myself, boy, uh, not everybody's feeling that way right now. You're yeah. kind of like putting all your stuff on this congregation, right? And that yeah. kind of, uh, that sort of bothered me. And then, um, and then I think about this pastor who I worked with for 11 years. And every time I, and it, I, I don't, again, I'm not begrudging anybody. I do the same thing. But every time I would ask this guy, hey, how are you doing? It was always, I'm great. And it, it just dawned on me after years of that, I thought, I, I'm sure at one of those times, at least one of those times, he wasn't great, which means... Mm -hmm. You know, he was just kind of, I don't know, lying to me, you know, which we all do. And yeah. so those are two extremes. Like I have the guy who's like so authentic that uh, nobody can relate to him. And then the guy who is so being so inauthentic that we, I don't know. Um, and I think both of those um, can be problematic. And both of those are, uh, I, we, that's, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just giving those two examples. You can make of yeah. them what you will. But those are the extremes, you know. I think yeah. that's good, Tony. No, that's that's good. I was going to, I just wrote down the word sensationalism. Mm -hmm. That we live in a, in, that I'm always really super cautious of even doing testimonies or doing anything. Because in our culture, especially with like Twitter, social media, everything, everything seems to be like sensationalized. I got ice cream from this place and you're taking a picture of it. And it's the most amazing ice cream ever. I'm being authentically happy that I'm taking ice cream. But is culture determining what is authentic and what is not? Mm -hmm. You know, to me, I know this sounds this is probably really simple, but I'm like, we have one one job. <laughs> it's, we use the phrase you got one job, you're a pilot fly the plane you know you got one one job and that is turn our attentions to jesus who is jesus what's jesus doing how is jesus doing are we authentically in our faith where we could talk about who jesus is i know that that and i don't want to you know have anybody go run with this ball and now okay now we have just have to be you know whatever i just it it's just what is your relationship 
who are you with God? Sometimes you're going to tell a close friend if you're okay, if you're not okay. Sometimes, you know, it's sensationalism to, to be either one of those extremes, Tony, that you brought up. And that's the funny line where I don't know, and I go back to what you said, nobody's going to be an expert. We only have perspectives. We only have, hey, put yourself in check or do that. Um, we live in a very consumer-based society. And I don't, once again, I don't know if that's worldwide, like you said earlier, or if it's just here. But but to be popular, you know, sometimes you have to be sensationalized. Well, I don't know if everybody wants to be popular or or say the next cute quip or, ooh, look at this, and I'm videotaping that and everything. We have to maybe make that assessment. Maybe that's part of our heart assessment is to look at who's defining us. Is culture defining us? Do we have to look cute? Do we have to do this? Do we have to be filmed just right to do our, you know, interviews um, for the, the jumbo, for the LED screen? I mean, I don't know. I don't know all of these things. All I know is that it really just does come back to genuinely, who is Jesus to you? Who are you in Jesus? If there's a message that you're going to pour, to present by facilitating songs or a story or a sermon, I feel like it has to be rooted in that very simplistic truth. You well, know, I've told this story, right, you know, go ahead. Well, let's flip it around a little bit. What if, what if the worship community is over uh, sensualizing, mm -hmm. sensationalizing? <laughs> Both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, There's a lot of that true. going on too. Are yeah, we about to talk about on. skinny jeans? Because if we're about to talk about skinny jeans, no, I have because whole... neither of us can fit in them. <laughs> but it's like you know, that's what's happening right now with like the recent news, Worship Leader magazine. Uh, there's always been the atmosphere that worship leaders have lived under that they must meet an expectation to be a worship leader, or mm -hmm. maybe that pressure is coming from their pastor or from their church or from what they read in the magazine or see on social. I don't think people read magazines yeah. anymore, but what they see on socials, like you said, but in an application to their own church. And then you have these leaders that can't be authentic because they're too busy trying to be like somebody else. So I mean, right. you're, you're a big proponent on that one. Well, I, I guess um, I'll go back to the Asbury thing. Again, it's not, it's not something I know about. It's just something I've read about like everybody else, but um, you know, the question can be raised, like, would that revival have been as big without social media or was it yeah. was it a revival or a viral moment? Um, <laughs> That's cool. And yeah, but there there may not be anything. I mean, the fact is, out of that, lots of people came. It lasted days and days and days. And then uh, other churches started trying to recreate this revival thing. And yeah. it was all the social mm -hmm. media that spread it now. Right that doesn't make it a bad thing. Like God can use social media. He's used social media in right. my life and, you know, social media is uh, theoretically, it's just communication. And, right. um, you know, so I don't have a problem with that, but um, I think it maybe you know, maybe there's no answer to any of this stuff. Maybe the answer is that it's just something for us to always be cautious of and yeah. question. And, um, and then whenever we are faced with, the opportunity to make a, de a decision related to that question, then we try to choose the decision that we believe is, you know, would be what God would want us to do in that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like just because somebody asked me how I'm doing, I have to tell them everything that's going on in my life. Right. Um, but I also know there are times when I, and people that I do need to be authentic with, you know, does that make me inauthentic to that other person? I don't know. Again, it's it's polite conversation. Our culture does polite small talk conversation. That's part of who we are as a people. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. You know, sometimes just saying, hey, how are you is a way of saying hello. It's not, you know, or even just saying it's it says I care for you. It doesn't mean I've got 20 minutes to go through all your life's problems right now. It's just a way of saying hello. So. Again, I don't know that there's a right or wrong. It's just that in those situations, we try to make the decisions in the moment based on what we believe God would be prompting us to do. And I think that that's good, too, because scripturally it says, hey, if there's a question, we're hoping to find to have an answer for it. Someone's got mm -hmm. a question. Now, a lot of people interpret that just the scripture. Maybe it is just the scripture, but we're we're doing things that we're attempting 
to to have a godly conscience about. We're attempting to um, to present a message and an, an unpopular message in a world right now, potentially. Um, I, there's no judgment on anybody's character. Everybody's built differently. You know, the most important thing is to know about yourself. You know, know mm-hmm. what you're, once again, going back to, you know, I sound like a broken record, but your own relationship. You know, we also protect other people from our stuff. You know, I don't know if it's altogether being inauthentic when we're when we're talking, but it's also having a care for other people, having a care for the congregation. Maybe they're not ready for whatever story is coming up or for a mood for the day. Maybe maybe it's about, you know, handling people the, the way that you that you handle your loved ones. Sometimes there are seasons where you're you're looking at them and observing that the best care, the best godly move that you can make is to is to make it about something else other than yourself, you mm-hmm. know, loving them in the way that helps them and uh, then confiding in people that can carry the weight that you have for the day. I mean, I just, it, it's funny to me how we have to talk about these things that used to be mm-hmm. so natural for uh, honorable society members or whatever, you know, that's part of love is to, is, is loving people that way. And and what is an EKG anyways? It's uh, an EKG is a, a look at your heart right at this yeah. moment. It doesn't mean yeah, it. right. It doesn't mean a week later your heart's not going to fail. Right. You no, know? you're right. But it means at this at this moment this is where you're at. So the EKG is an ongoing. You know, I mean, it, may, it maybe would help us to each have EKG machines in our home and every right. week we do a check and just see where it's going. And <laughs> that's right. You know, but that's that's kind of the process of of. Our, our faith journey, right, is constant checks. It's not ever mm-hmm. reaching perfection. It's constantly checking where we're at. Mm. Right. I mean, that's that. so good. You know, even having the conversation about it, I mean, it, it's it's so good. There are no answers. It's like, you know, we used to travel to teach other churches worship and everything. It always felt so weird. It was like, we are establishing the standard to teach worship. And it always felt weird where it's really mm-hmm. just helping people where they're at, having conversations, pulling out potentially or mirroring to them what they're what they're good at or what's good in that. It is, you know, and maybe that's what we get to do right now is we get to just mirror out some conversations that need to have, whether it's between ourselves and God or with friends or, or with other leaders or whatever. These are things that, that are good to talk about are good to put in checks and balances, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, Awesome thoughts, you guys. Uh, Thank you, Tony, Sharia. And just to wrap up um, as we were going through this segment I found this verse coming from Psalm 57, and I want you to think about the environment in which David wrote these words because he was being chased by Saul, of course, you know, and (laughs) he is fleeing from him, hiding in a cave, afraid for his life that he will die that very moment. And he wrote these words coming from Psalm 57, um, verse. Seven, he says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. What's significant about that is that David was steadfast hiding in the cave and praising anyway. He wasn't just steadfast on a mountaintop. Everything's great, and I'll sing and praise you, Lord, not faking it, going through the motions, cosmetics, but EKG, he's checking his heart. Mm. And that's such a good model for us to keep before us. Tony, I love it to constantly be checking ourselves, self-calibration, spiritual calibration, and let God do that heart work. So with that in mind, we're going to close for today. We thank you guys for joining us here on the Worst Teen Training Podcast as we will come up with new episodes coming down to your playlist. And we ask that you would subscribe to this podcast. Thanks so much again for joining us. Again, Tony, Sharia, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you.